time for Wednesday's hour number two on Hashtag Daily K with your host, Peter Bint. Korean dramas, movies and even lyrics. Why is the world paying attention to Korea? Korean stories. From classics to modern masterpieces, time to dig deep into the charms of Korean literature. On Check It Out with Paul. Paul Matthews, our literature expert, is in the studio. Our bookworm, our consumer of tomes with a shirt that is as low cut as Key's. Are you having a contest with Key? No, I mean, this is, it's still summer. It is still, still hot and humid. Yeah, I, I got I soaked appreciate. through yesterday. I was wearing an Oxford shirt yesterday and I got soaked through. Well, you should have worn a Cambridge one, shouldn't you? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, did you get caught in the rain? Uh, well, no, it was, it was... I had an umbrella. Oh, OK. But the problem is, is mm. that it was so humid yesterday. I was walking yeah. around. I was in Pundang. Okay. It's a ve- very nice area. Lovely job. Trying here. to find somewhere to eat. I uh-huh. could not been to that particular place. I was looking at different restaurants. I was Ooh. searching on the maps, you know, where, okay. where's good to eat. And, yeah. and I ended up... I got into the restaurant and yeah. I was... Literally, my shirt was soaked through. Oh, lovely. What did you end up eating? I had a giant meatball on a plate of spaghetti. One giant meatball. One giant meatball. It was a very delicious meatball. Really? Was yeah, it, good? it was very good. I often feel that if the meatball gets too big, it can get a bit dry and not so flavoured. It wasn't, though. Wow. I think they may have steamed them Ooh. beforehand and then sort of pan fried them. Nice. But it was it was solid. It was a big boy. We're yeah. talking like the size of a child's fist. Wow. Um, but it was moist throughout. Yes. And the sauce was fresh, and the pasta was perfectly cooked, and had a little bit of rocket on top, and some parmesan cheese, and I was oh. pretty impressed. It was a, a little expensive, but it was a good meal. Did you go to Jongjadong? I Bundang? did. That's the fancy area. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So I was around there. I had a meeting there with wow. clients, clients, and uh, I had time for lunch. My auntie Mihua lives there. Next time, if you fancy I'll, I'll it, tell the name of the restaurant. Yeah. No, I mean you can go to hers for lunch. Instead. Does she make meatballs? Not that I know of, okay. but she does make a good miokguk, some seaweed soup. Mm, there you go. Not bad, not bad. Uh, have you had a good week before I get into today's it's hashtag? Been, it's been a good week. It's been the week of changes. Oh. Because we've had the rain, yeah. and that's cooled things down. And so we've Life had a few... time's not too bad. Yeah. No. Well, more specifically the mornings, uh-huh. stepping out of the house and yeah. having a bit of a cool breeze and going, do I need a jacket? And then thinking, no, it's going to be hot in half an hour. <laughs> but it's, yeah, you're feeling like the change towards autumn is coming. Coming. And Absolutely. we talked about yesterday, the magic of Choso. Yeah. It was a little delayed, but it's here now. It is, definitely. Although I did see worryingly on my weather app, it says maybe in next week, early next week, we'll have 25 as the low again one day. These things happen. Korea, it's normally four days, then three days, then four days, then three days when we come out of summer or out of winter, oh, where yeah. we sort of get these ups and downs, these highs and lows. So yeah. it's we're on the way. A little weather expert, aren't you? you? Know, I don't know my, no my onions. Um, let's Let's get to today's book then. I've been previewing it. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the author's name right. Juna? Juna. Juna, okay. Yeah, Juna. This is our second time featuring them. We featured a short story before, but the first time we're getting a proper, solid, full-length novel from them. Uh, It came out this summer. It's called Counterweight, or Pyongyang Chu. It's translated by Anton Herr, and I'm really excited about bringing it today because... As you know, I love genre fiction. I love sci-fi. Oh. I love Juno, and I want to read more of them. Uh, and strap yourself in, Peter. Okay. Do you have a belt? I've got a belt on, yes. <laughs> okay. We've got a futuristic tale involving electronic brain worms, AI, chable power struggles, and a space elevator. Brain worms? Yeah. Wait, electronic brain worms? Yeah. I saw on the BBC news that they found for the first time a live, a live worm, worm yeah. in someone's brain. In an Australian woman's brain. It's not electronic, though, is it? No, that was just a worm worm. Just a normal worm in a woman's brain? Well, not like an earthworm. Well, I didn't click on it, so I didn't get to see what well, kind of worm. there were all sorts of parasites. Oh, Did you never goodness. have worms as a kid? Yeah, but why was it live for the first time? It obviously found a home and liked it there. All right. But it's not to do with that Aussie lady. Not that we know of, anyway. Uh, Juna, we don't know too much about. We know very, very little about them. We don't know oh. their gender. We don't know who they are. Wow. They have used the name Lee Young-soo 
in the past in their early work, but that's a very common name, okay. and people think it's not their name anyway. Ah. They never do interviews in person. <gasps> they only do them online or by email. <sighs> But they've been publishing since the 90s. They sort of got a big internet presence. Wow. And they've had something like seven short story anthologies, six novels or so. They've published essays on film criticism and on science fiction. There's actually, if you're interested, if, you, mm. if this book interests you, there was uh, an interview in Wired magazine uh -huh. uh, earlier this summer, I think in June. You can find it to read online for free. In English? Yes, wow. translated by Anton Herr. He did the translation during the interview process by oh, email. Oh, nice. Um, and it's got a lot more information about the inspirations for the book, but also the inspirations for Juna. And if you like what you hear, I highly recommend it. I fell even more in love with them and their attitude because their knowledge of science fiction is incredible. They're obviously Ooh. a really geeky, passionate person yeah. when it comes to this kind of fiction. And uh, it was really inspiring to read. Wow, okay. That just makes you more intrigued when there's less information about who this actually is, right? Yeah. We do know a lot about Anton Herr. Too much, probably. Yeah, come on, Anton. Be a He's bit always got mysterious. a book out, book out, hasn't he? He's got the BTS book with Claire Richards and Slim Jung. That was a number one seller on the New York Times bestseller list. Goodness me, he's been long-listed and shortlisted for the Booker Prize mm. for Love in the Big City and Cursed Bunny. He's very good. He is very good, and he's very, very sort of positive and active in promoting translation. What I loved mm. in the sort of translators afterward, yeah. um, he bigged up other translators who've translated Korean science fiction, oh, like well, Soje nice. and Sophia Bowman and Slim Jung and uh, Song Liu. Um, and I think he takes a lot of time to really promote others and support others. He's involved in teaching when it comes to translation and getting involved in mentoring and things like that. And it's really good to see someone who is maybe at the peak of their success, or maybe no. even not quite there yet, helping others out. Absolutely. Now, breaking news. All breaking. On Sunday on social media, Anton Herr announced his own first novel <gasps> is going to be published summer 2024. It is science fiction. It's called Toward Eternity. Wow. And it's all about what happens if science can replace human cells with artificial ones. So he is... I don't know whether he's going to permanently transition to author mm. as opposed to translator, whether he's going to keep them in tandem. Wow. But that's going to be one to look out for next summer. Absolutely. I hope we can read that on our show as well. I'm I'll, sure I'll we, ask him. We can shoehorn it into our, our categories as well. Uh, do we need to set the scene for our first reading today? Uh, I'm just going to say, when you start reading this book, you're dropped into the middle of it. Oh. It's one of these science fiction books where they the author doesn't give you, like, <sighs> A lot of backstory up front. You're okay. like, you're dropped into the action, and then you have to work out what's going on. It takes a bit of time. So the first reading, you may be a bit like, what is this? But then we'll talk about it, and we'll get into it. All right, let's get dropped in the middle. Clink. 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 A nickel and a quarter are dancing on Rex Tamaki's left hand. Controlled by tiny movements of the index and little fingers, these thin metal discs fly up, spin, roll and leapfrog over each other like they're living beings with free will. The dance of the coins ends as abruptly as it started. Realising he was distracting me, Tamaki snatches the coins from the air and drops them into his pocket, throwing me a smirk. A provocative and seductive smirk. Tamaki isn't gay, he just enjoys pushing buttons and stringing people along. Miffed, I looked away. The interior of the plane is quiet. The only thing I hear through my non-augmented ears is the low drone of the engines. This apparent silence is deceptive. Judging from the continuous smirking of Tamaki's personnel, I can tell they're sending silent messages to each other. They did open a channel for me too, but since I entered the cabin, not one person has engaged me in conversation. Not that I care. They can keep their stupid jokes. Rex Tamaki, contrasting with his gorilla-like colleagues with their muscles bursting out of their shirts, looks almost slight. But you can't trust looks these days. No one's strength is in proportion to their muscles anymore. Since he lost his Olympic gold medal 15 years ago in a doping scandal, Tamaki's body has undergone several phases of modification, the current version, now before me, is clearly the handiwork of someone who treats rules and regulations with contempt. The alarm inside my head strikes 2200 hours. For the next 18 hours, judicial power of the Gondal Quarter 
will transfer from Tamoe's government to the LK group. Don't even ask me what I had to do flitting between islands trying to make this happen. Tamaki and his gang, almost synchronized, get up from their seats. I feel a kind of floating sensation as we begin to descend and the golden hatch in front of me spins open. Our hummingbird circles over the Gondel Quarter at 300 meters and descends like an elevator. Through the widening hatch I can see the coastline village that looks like a scattering of plastic boxes. As the hatch widens and the plane begins to slow down at 15 meters, the Tamaki gang begin jumping off one by one. Despite their bulky bodies, they move with such grace that their feet hardly make a sound as they land on the roofs of the buildings and disappear into the village. I remain secured in my seat, seatbelt fastened, looking on. Hot air blows through the hatch into the interior. It smells of the village. Food, fish, excrement, trash, people. In that mess of boxes are thousands of people breathing, eating, excreting, sleeping, vomiting, copulating and popping out babies. My insides turn. Shall we have some fun, Mac? Tamaki's voice, and like all voices that come over the worm, it's oddly separated from ambient noise. The voice of a god stripped of its sanctity, with only the monstrosity remaining. Welcome to Arirang Radio. If you are in Jeju, 88.7 in Jeju City, 88.1 in Seogipu City, 101.9 in the Daejeong area. Uh, we had a really interesting reading, but like you said, we dropped into the middle of God knows what. With these people, like, I don't know, I feel like they might be rebels or criminals or something. They're about to do something mischievous. Something dodgy is going on, whether it's criminal or not. Well, when it comes to a chebol, oh. when it comes to a big company, one might think they can get away with murder. Okie dokie. So who are all these characters? Is it told from this point of view the whole way through? Do you not want to read the messages first? Oh, okay. What messages? Yeah, uh, I've got messages in my hand, Peter. Well, you didn't share them, did you? They were there and you didn't pick them up. No, read away. Read them all. all don't right. give any to me. You can, have, well, you can have this one. No, I don't want it. Take it. Jennifer, to be nice to Jennifer's message. All right. Siska says, oh, the book cover is cool. And Stacey Wiley says, I love the cover of the book. Yeah, it is very cool, the Korean cover. To describe for our listeners who aren't watching, what's going on there? I haven't got my glasses on, so you'll have to do it. There looks to be a statue of a man being thrust into the air like he's almost flying on a wave, like that Iceman from the X-Men. Was there an Iceman character, you know, who used to, like, have ice underneath him? Or was that X-Men or Fantastic Four or something? Denny's saying thumbs up. I don't know his name, though. I, th I think Denny's angry with you. He's always angry with me. And then it says Pyongyang Chu up there. Yeah. Oh, uh, Also, quick shout-out to uh, to Stacey. Um, happy birthday for next week. I know you wanted me to say it to you next week, but Peter's not allowing me in on a Wednesday. Yeah, he's not next here Wednesday. next week. So We're I'm only saying it very now. special guest Happy week. birthday for next week. He doesn't mean it. Jennifer Woods. Hang on. No. Says... <laughs> no, Peter. <laughs> That's rude. All right, he means it. He's sincere. Yeah. Is that all right now? Stacey always says, please don't fight. Can okay? I get on with the Jennifer I'm saying Wood happy message. birthday, Stacey. I always mean the happy birthdays to our listeners. All right. So I'm picturing a hive mind type of situation reminding me of the Borg collective thinking. Ah, oh, with the worms and yeah, whatnot. It's a little bit of... Ooh, I don't know whether it's quite hive mind, but mm. it may well turn into something. Uh -huh. So... We're dropped into this situation. It's very unclear. Yeah. What we do know, Tamaki is part of this LK security team. Uh -huh. And Mac, who's the narrator, is an executive for the external affairs department of LK. Okay. And they're here at the fictional island of Patusan. And this is somewhere in Southeast Asia, near Brunei, near Indonesia. Oh, so it's on planet Earth, yes. this sci-fi. And they're here to take out a group of terrorists. Okay. So they've got control, judicial control over for the next few hours. Uh-huh. And they basically go in, guns blazing, get rid of them. Uh -huh. And they also gather these worms in their brains, these electronic worms. Oh, they're in, like, everyone's brains. In a lot of people. Okay. Yeah, and because you can get the info, you can pull the info out of the worms. Oh. They want to find out if there are any internal spies or moles in LK <gasps> linked to this terrorist group. Oh, wow. And as Max sort of scrolling through the information, there's one name that sticks out. <gasps> che Kangu. Okay. And he's an LK space worker. Uh-oh. 
And it seems like he's being targeted by this group, the Liberation Front. And there's one guy, all he knows, the initials are ZS. Okay. And Che's a bit of an environmentalist. He loves butterflies. Okay. But he's also part of LK Space Elevator Operations on Patusan. Okay. And he's a bit of a loser. It took him three tries to get into the company. Okay. And yet he got in. He was obviously persistent. Oh, he wanted to for a reason. Yeah. And the info seems to show that ZS has tried courting Che, like introducing him to other members of this terrorist group. Mm. But things sort of fizzled out. Okay. And Max, like, eh, probably not too much to worry about mm. until... Oh. He detects someone entering a warehouse storage locker that they should not be in. Oh. Only two people knew about this locker. Uh-huh. Himself and the deceased former president of LK, Han Jung Hyuk. Oh. It's held under this fake name of Damon Chu. Damon Chu's not real. It's mm. sort of this avatar, this scarecrow they made. Uh-huh. And he checks up on it and he finds out it's Che who was the one accessing it. Oh, so He's been somewhere he shouldn't have been. Okay. But how can he know about this? Only two people on the planet knew about it. Right. So things are really starting to look a little bit fishy. Yeah. So Mac takes things into his own hands. He's not telling anyone at LK about this. Contacts oh. Che, interviews him, finds out about ZS. Che seems like a bit of a gullible idiot. All right. He's not a spy. I'm he seems innocent. Sure. Okay. But there's something... Strange. There's something familiar about the way he talks. When he starts talking about the space elevator, mm. feels like there's something clicking in Mac's brain. Oh, who is this guy? Yeah, and he's investigating. He finds out that this ZS fellow is someone called Nebro Shaughnessy, who's an employee of an industrial espionage agency named Green Fairy. <laughs> and so Mac's like, OK, I'll get Che together with Shaughnessy and we'll track them and we'll see if we can find out what's going on. Good plan. But things go very wrong. Bad plan. And it seems like... O'Shaughnessy is going to try and kill Che and Mac has to intervene huh. and it ends up with O'Shaughnessy dying. Something explodes in his brain as if someone has detonated it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And they realise that he was trying to extract a worm from Che's head. Oh. But he's failed and someone's remotely killed him. Uh-oh. So at this point, Mac is really worried about what's going on. He's also worried about his own position in the company okay. because he was good friends with the deceased president. Yeah. The deceased president's son, who's not his biological son, uh -oh. doesn't really like him. Ah, so he's on the way out, potentially. Potentially. Goes to Green Fairy, sees the head of it, Sumac Grasscamp, wants to get some answers. And she's straight up saying, look, we didn't kill him. We oh. don't know what's going on. We didn't know he was a spy for the Liberation Front. Something weird is going on here. Oh. And so Mac is deep in this, mm. and he's not sure what's going on. And he, he meets up with Che again. He's trying to figure out what it is about him that seems so odd and yet seems so familiar. Oh, I'm Takes curious. him out for dinner, yeah. gets him drunk, and they start talking, and again, they're talking about the space elevator. And then there's something that Che says that sticks in Mac's mind. Okay. Something that directly links to the former president. And now we join him as he starts to work out what that is. You always thought that, even when I told you it wasn't so. I remember those words. Not because they have some important meaning, but because of the opposite. They have almost no meaning, or just a throwaway comment, or at least as far as I can remember. I don't recall their context. What I do recall is President Han Jung-hyuk's laughing face as he looks into my puzzled eyes. When I ask him again what he means, President Han merely repeats his words, chuckling. Annoying as it is to be laughed at for no reason, he's the head of the LK group, so I keep my mouth shut. That was ten years ago. My Korean, which I'd learned through the worm, was still clunky. Speaking Korean made me feel like the surface membrane of my personality was separating from my body, making me feel very anxious. This happened with languages I'd learned through other means too, but anyone who learned a language using one of the worm's earlier models suffered through particularly acute versions of this side effect. The other thing about the worm's language education system is that it creates ghosts. Figures that hover in your peripheral vision, stumbling along the borders of several languages, muttering strange spells. After the funeral, one of my ghosts started talking in President Han's voice. 
When Che Kang U said what he said, I heard two voices at once Che Kang U's and the congruently superimposed voice of my ghost. For a moment, I thought I'd misheard that it had been the ghost voice alone, but no, the words had been spoken from Che Kang U's mouth in Che Kang U's voice. Che Kang U speaking Han Jung Hyuk's lines. I wondered if it was a code of some sort, but that couldn't be. Che Kang-ho seems unaware that his recent words have any meaning. Clearly, it was something stashed in his mind, taking advantage of his alcohol adult state to emerge and make itself known. Something. Something that carries Han Jung Hyuk's memories. When I escort him to his apartment, Che Kang-ho doesn't seem to notice me staring at his family photos and the obscene wooden egg. He says a half-hearted goodbye and disappears into the bathroom. I close the door behind me as I leave. On the escalator, I'm lost in thought. The puzzle pieces in my mind are clicking into place. This schlub, who had no real hobbies or interests except lepidotery until a few years ago, suddenly becomes a fanatic of the space elevator and enters LK space with the second highest marks, a feat that included not only acing the written exam but impressing the highly skeptical live interviewers. The easiest and simplest answer to the question of how this happened is that a worm containing President Han's memories is in Che kang brain. I gotta say, I, I called it early on. I thought, yep, yeah, there's may. I thought maybe the former owner is using his body, but maybe it's not gone quite that it's not far. Not quite there, but yeah, there seems to be a presence <gasps> of the former president Han in Che's brain. So you can like put these worms from other people into other people's brains. Well, not usually. Oh, this is the thing, and so. There has to be something going on. It's, it's, it's about all the AI and the worms, but there's, there's something else as well. Okay. Because the worms act as communication devices, mm -hmm. and they can also store information, and they can teach you. But then Mac discovers that Che had used a company to help cheat his way into a job at LK on that third time. Oh. And what this company did was insert a degradable biobot into his brain that would help him with the answers to the test okay. and help him do the interview All and right. get through the interview. And Matt confronts Che. He confesses everything. Mm. Uh, he said, I, yeah, I had it done and it helped me get the job. And it didn't just give me the right answers on the exam. But then in the interview, it was like I became a different person. I became so eloquent talking oh, about things. Wow, that's good for him. And then afterwards, I began to feel this love for a woman, a, a woman I, I didn't know. Oh. I suddenly had these memories coming up. And he worked out, Che, that it was Kim Jae-in, the head of LK Space Development Research Centre, who was also President Han's niece, not oh. related by blood. Okay. And this is now getting very complicated. Max found himself in a really dodgy situation. Okay. Because if it's involving the higher-ups in LK, yeah. then his head could be on the block. Um, and the president, President Ross Lee, is probably on his way out. Uh. So Mac thinks, I need to do something drastic. And he goes back to Green Fairy and says, you need to help me. Mm -hmm. And they have the equipment to examine Che's brain and the worm and the area of the brain affected by the biobot. In fact, they examined other people who'd had this biobot in them before. Oh, the same one. Yeah. And Mac is also really worried about Rex Tamaki, that security guy mm -hmm. we met at the start of the story. He thinks he's probably going to be gunning for him. Uh -huh. There's some long-running bad blood between them. Oh, no. So Green Fairy does the operation, does the investigation. They also give Mac a face transplant so what? he can go incognito. Okay. Yeah, in just a couple of hours, they can change the way he looks. Wow. And then he's just waiting for Che to wake up, and then he thinks we can make our next move. And that's where we find him in our final excerpt, sitting next to the hospital bed, waiting for Che to wake. Oh. Download the Arirang Radio app on your device for free. It's Arirang. A-R-I-R-A-N-G Radio. The green witch exits, and I am left alone with Che kang -woo. I stare at his body lying motionless on the bed and groan as I pull up a chair. It's like being left alone with a dog I'd just rescued. 
like I'd done a stupid good deed and now the consequences are snowballing. Was this the best thing I could have done under the circumstances? Wouldn't it have been better to secure what treasures the former president had given me and leave LK? Go into hiding? I guess it's not too late now. If I choose to stay with Green Fairy, they'll give me something to do at least. Surely Han Su Hyun has no earthly reason to bother with little old me anymore if I just disappear. The problem is, he has many earthly reasons. Up until recently I'd made a huge fuss about how important I was, all in the name of trying pr to protect myself after the President's death, implying that he had given me more than he actually had. It was also an attempt to boost my division and win against the other divisions in the company. But now that I think back on it, I was an idiot. Han Su Hyun is an idiot too, but at least he's not alone. He's surrounded by cunning players who have filled their pockets by always having his back. They're a bit scattered at the moment, but it's only a matter of time before they regroup under him. Who knows how this will manifest once Ross Lee leaves the company. Tamaki will probably choose which side he's on at last. Seeing how little fun he'd be able to get out of me then, he'd leave me like a cat leaves a half-dead bird. The only way I can survive now is to make all my fuss, my nonsense, come true. Che Kango squirms. The monitor lights up above his headboard and there's a chime. He opens his mouth and moans. He's squirming again. The whole metal bed is shaking. Then he grabs my left arm and starts cursing me out. Harsh, but his words are in Korean and weirdly old-fashioned, almost archaic, making him seem more ridiculous and intimidating. Two nurses run up to us and separate him from me injecting his neck with a tranquilizer. The screams subside into sobs. I shoulder my way between the nurses. Che Kango's eyes, unfocused, suddenly grow wide as he sees my face. I killed the Mac! I killed those people! It's Che Kango's voice, but something about his cadence reminds me of the former president. Killed who? Adnan Ahmad! And all those people! The tranquilizer kicks in and his voice grows faint. I leave him to the nurses and walk out of the room in a daze. So he is like the old president, Che Kang Wu. Something more strange has happened than just a little degradable bot in his brain. But who on earth is Adnan Ahmed? The only Adnan I know was from that serial podcast. Did he kill the serial podcast killer who might not be a killer? What's happening? Is this the end of the book? Welcome to another cliffhanger ending with Paul Matthews. Oh. We're halfway through the story and you need to buy the book if you want to find out what happens next. No, you've read the book, so tell us. No, Just no, 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 I'm not going to tell you. Uh, all I'll say is there's trouble at the table. President Han seemingly is living inside Che's mind in a strange sort of way. There's more happening with the space elevator than we knew at first. What is the space elevator? It's an elevator that goes into space. From Earth? Yes, that okay. you can send little crafts up it oh. to to something. I'm not oh. going to mention what. Oh. And the second half is this mystery roller coaster. Max trying to get to the bottom of all this. He's trying to avoid getting killed himself. And it feels really timely. I mean... This year has been the year that everyone's become interested in AI. Yeah. In the power of AI with, mm -hmm. you know, chat GPT and all the other AI bots. Uh -huh. And we're starting to sort of realise how powerful they could be. Yeah. And this book, you know, it's set in the perhaps not so distant future. Oh. Uh, when AI becomes more involved in our lives than ever and possibly does there come a point where we're not needed, we're not necessary, that, mm. that there are jobs that basically humans don't need to do anymore. Perhaps. It's fascinating. If you're a fan of, of proper good old-fashioned sci-fi, this is a great read. And there's lots of really interesting, intricate references to all sorts of other things. I oh. can't talk about it now. We don't have the time. But okay. trust me, if you're a bit geeky, nerdy, yeah. you like your sci-fi, it's a great book. Mm. It also has something to say about Korea and Korea's attitude in terms of business towards Southeast Asia. 
Oh, really? Yeah, the way that companies take advantage of companies that maybe have less power than Korea. Uh-huh. Yeah, and so of course this is this is this is fiction, mm. but it's sort of riffing on the idea that maybe Korea is following in that spirit of colonialism that the Europeans had during the days of empire mm. that Japan had at the start of the 20th century, doing it in their own way, but still at the same time maybe. taking advantage in areas and places. Interesting social take to this story as well. Give us your one-line review, please. A mind-bending, twisted AI, saturated mystery that makes you pay attention and start to wonder about the possibilities the future may hold for... (gasps) Dun-dun-dun. Humanity. Does Paul have an electric worm in his head or just a regular one? Go on somewhere else. (laughs) We'll find out. Uh, Thank you so much for your reading today, Paul. Thanks to everyone. Thanks to the Literature Translation Institute of Korea for the help always. And thanks to Juna for their story, to Anton Herr for his excellent translation. Next week, I'm not back with another book. No. I will be back in two weeks' time with a fabulous short story available for free online. It's called Noodles by Kim Sum, translated by Brother Anthony and Sonjay. You can find it on his website, Noodles by Kim Sum. Yes, Teto. Some of the books we do are free short stories, but a lot of them are paid for. So if you want to find out more, yes, then you need to buy them. I buy my own copies, Just like Paul. Yeah, maybe. Spend a lot of money. Maybe you can. Don't get reimbursed. Borrow his or something. I've got the receipts. All right, get out now, Paul. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much. Yeah, have a great time without me next week. You can listen to Check It Out with Paul Matthews on Adidang Radio's Hashtag Daily K every Wednesday from 10am KST.